The Gospel of John, session five. In this session, we're going to take a look at John 6, 25 to 752. And we'll start by thinking about John 6, 25 to 59. 6, 25 to 29, the crowd now locates Jesus and it appears that their understanding of him has actually diminished. When, we let, when it last met him, the crowd wanted to make him king. And now it refers to him as rabbi. Jesus offers his own diagnosis of what the crowd is looking for. Its fascination with signs has worn off and now it is simply seeking food. Needless to say, Jesus is not surprised by this fact. He now begins a conversation with the crowd that reminds us of his previous conversation with Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman at the well. The crowd is searching for the food that perishes when it should be seeking the food that endures to eternal life. There's a food which yields eternal life and it is given by the Son of Man. The Son can give this food because the Father has set his seal of authenticity upon him. The crowd misunderstands what Jesus says, for its question in 628 takes away from what Jesus has just said. It seems to have taken the labor of 627 literally. The works of God are those actions pleasing to God, and are set forth in the law, which is a source of life. But in Jesus, one finds life, capital L. Remember the contrast drawn in 117. The work that is pleasing to God begins with belief in the Son, whom he has sent, who brings life and light, and to whom the Holy Spirit bears witness. The rest of the discourse will have this theme as its central presupposition. 6, 30 to 33. The crowd realizes that Jesus is speaking of himself, and so it asks him two questions. What signs do you do which authenticate your claim? And what work of God do you do? They feel confident in trusting Moses because he gave their ancestors manna in the wilderness. In 631, they cite Exodus 16.4. Within Judaism, this bread was understood to refer to the law. The law gives life. Can Jesus do something even greater? For them, there is nothing beyond Moses and beyond Torah. Can Jesus challenge the unique authority of Moses? And can Jesus surpass what Moses gave to Israel? Jesus points out that it was not Moses who gave the bread in the wilderness, but God. And Jesus claims to be the true bread from heaven, which gives life to the world. The manna of Exodus 16 is a prefiguration of Jesus. In 634 to 40, the crowd clearly misunderstands Jesus for it asks to be given this bread again and again. Jesus has to make it clear that he himself is the bread from heaven and that he is the once for all gift of God. Whoever comes to him and believes in him will find permanent satisfaction. It's important to note that Jesus speaks in the future tense here. There will be a future moment at which this bread from heaven will be supplied. Jesus emphasizes the complete unity between himself and the Father. Those who come to him in faith are given to him by the Father, and his will and the will of the Father are one. The will of the Father is that all, note the universal emphasis, all who believe in the Son should have eternal life. The nature of eternal life is hinted at in 640. Eternal life and resurrection of the body mutually qualify one another. 641 to 51. Note that in 641, the crowd becomes the Jews. They raise an objection. How can Jesus claim to be bred from heaven when his human parents are known? To the extent that one focuses on Jesus' human origins, one will fail to understand him. In 644, Jesus emphasizes his origins from the Father. The Father has sent him and draws people to him. Jesus is speaking of a fundamental shift away from the dynamic of the Old Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, God taught Israel through the law. Now, the Father draws people to himself from all nations through the Son. 
In 645, Jesus refers to Isaiah 54, 13 and claims to be its fulfillment. Through him, all the people will be taught by God. The status of the Son is made clear in 646. Only the Son knows the Father, and so only he can make him known. Jesus contrasts himself with the manna in the wilderness. Those who ate the bread in the wilderness eventually died. Jesus is the bread who comes down from heaven and makes it possible to live forever. 651 concludes with a revelation. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Note once again, the future tense is used, and this focus is firmly on Jesus. The bread to be given has something to do with his self-offering. In 652 to 59, we see that, that Jews have now misunderstood Jesus. In responding to them, Jesus does not say that he's only speaking symbolically or metaphorically. Rather, he emphasizes that he is speaking of his flesh and blood. My flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Meaning that what he's hinted at in 6, 1 through 14 has Eucharistic overtones. That Jesus is speaking of actually eating becomes clear in 654, where he shifts from using the verb to eat in 653 to a verb which means literally to crunch with teeth. Jesus is not speaking of a spiritual eating here. The emphasis falls here on both the word enfleshed and the physical nature of Jesus' death. The separation of flesh and blood is the Old Testament idiom for sacrifice, so that Jesus is already interpreting his physical death on the cross as a sacrifice. Jesus insists that his flesh is true food and that his blood is true drink. In, six, in 656, Jesus says that whoever crunches his flesh with their teeth and drinks his blood will live or abide in him. It's important to note that believing Jesus and eating his flesh and drink and blood are sort of parallel expressions and both convey the idea of a person entering into the life of Jesus. Those who share in the life of Jesus will pass from death to life. And this section closes in 658 with another contrast between the man and Jesus. Once again, as in 649 to 50, the emphasis falls on the fact that those who ate the manna in the wilderness died, but those who feed on Jesus' flesh and blood will be granted to live forever. One encounters Jesus' true food and true drink in the Eucharist, which offers a truthful interpretation of his sacrificial death and in which his flesh and blood are sacramentally present. John 6, 60 to 71. Since 641, Jesus has been addressing the Jews. And now at 660, the response of the disciples to what Jesus has been saying is reported. They have seen Jesus' self-revelation in 616 to 21, and yet some of them find what he said about himself impossible to accept. Jesus has claimed to reveal God in a way that surpasses Moses and the law. And some disciples find this impossible to believe, like Nicodemus. Jesus challenges them with a question. If you saw me ascending into the presence of God, would you then believe? Would that convince you? These disciples are kept from faith by their insistence that their own human standards determine what is possible. They're attempting to measure Jesus with standards which will always fall short. Their outlook is fleshly, earthly, earthbound. This outlook is of no value. Only the revelation of the Son and the work of the Spirit can really result in faith. Ultimately, discipleship is a gift of the Father, for it's not information which makes disciples or human desire, but response to the Son made possible by the Spirit given by the Father. At 667, disciples are now narrowed down to the 12. Would they like to leave as well? Peter responds for the group and acknowledges the truth of what Jesus has said in 663. The words which Jesus speaks are indeed spirit and life. Peter speaks in 668 to 69 as one who has been led to Jesus by the Father. Peter sees Jesus as the Holy One of God. And this is only possible because he has been led to the Son by the Father. 
Faith recognizes that Jesus' origins are from God. And the confession of faith takes place the same time that the betrayer is mentioned in 670. What an irony. John 7, 1 through 9. 7, 1 indicates that Jesus now continues in his activity in Galilee since the Jews in Judea are now planning to kill him. However, the Feast of Booths has arrived and it was the obligation of all male Jews to go to Jerusalem to keep this feast. Jesus' brothers offer counsel which reveals their misunderstanding of him. They advise him to go to Judea so that his works can be seen and so that he can show himself. They fail to see that Jesus is not simply known by his works and that he has not come to show himself, but to reveal God. If Jesus' brothers are disbelieving, we should think of disbelief as being fairly widespread. Jesus makes a distinction between my time and your time in 7-6. Jesus and his brothers belong to two different worlds and two different times. Jesus' time is dictated by the Father's design, while the brothers' time is dictated by their own wishes. The world, that is creation corrupted by sin, hates Jesus, while his brothers face no such hatred because they don't challenge it. Jesus announces that he is not going up to this feast. What does follow the design of the Father and not of others is what he thinks he should do. This theme appears several times and will reappear with particular clarity in chapter 11. Jesus follows the direction of the Father. John 7, 10 through 36. In 7, 10 through 13, we find the completion of the preparation for the narrative which follows in 7, 14 to 36. In 7, 10, Jesus reverses his earlier decision. Why? John wishes us to conclude that this is not, this is due to the Father. Jesus follows the will and prompting of the Father, not his mother, not his brothers, or anyone else. He's certainly not guided by the wishes of popular demand. Note that Jesus deliberately goes against the advice of his brothers. He goes to Jerusalem, but in private. He does not go in order to show himself during this Feast of the Jews. The Jews are looking for him. Remember 518, the Jews were intent on killing him. That's why. We get the sense of a popular debate about Jesus in 712 to 13. There's much muttering about him with opinion being clearly divided. Neither of the opinions mentions, mentioned is correct. Jesus is neither a good man, nor is he leading the people astray. Midway through the feast, Jesus goes to the temple to teach. The Jews marvel at Jesus, and this alerts us to the fact that marveling at Jesus is not a proper response to him. It's not real faith. Jesus does not teach with any recognized authority. He has not studied Torah, he's not a recognized teacher, and is wholly suspect. This allows Jesus to address the issue of his authority. Jesus makes it clear that his teaching is not his own, but that of the Father. And he says that all genuine desire to do God's will will really be able to recognize this. A genuine openness to God results in the reception of Jesus. Because Jesus seeks the glory of the Father who sent him, he is to be trusted, for there is no falsehood in him. By implication, there is falsehood in those who reject him. In 7, 14 through 24, the Jews claim that their authority derives from Moses, who derived his authority from God. Jesus draws a direct line from Moses to himself, such that the law is fulfilled in him. The attempt to kill him could only result from a rejection of God's will. Thus, Jesus accuses the Jews of not keeping the law. Note the final argument here. The rejection of Jesus is a rejection of the law. In 720, the crowd, distinct from the Jews, speaks. It knows of no attempt to kill Jesus, and so concludes that somehow he's insane. The Jews have replaced, have replaced Jesus with the crowd, and it's still in the process now of making a decision. In 721, Jesus refers to his actions in 5, 1 through 18. Actions they marveled at. 
Jesus then refers to Jewish tradition, which held that it was acceptable to circumcise a male child on the Sabbath because it was a fulfillment of the law and the completion of the person. Such a thing, life-giving thing, such a thing of importance overrides the law. And in this case, Jesus asks, why do they object to his restoration of a person's full potential? The problem, Jesus asserts, is that they judge by appearances. And this is because they are unable to see the completion of the law before them. Because of this, all their judgments will be finally wrong. In 725 to 31, it seems that the audience now, a new audience has been introduced, some of the people of Jerusalem. Whoever these people are, they know of the plot to kill Jesus. This group marvels at the fact that Jesus is speaking openly and that no attempt is made to stop him. Significantly, this group knows, or says it knows, that Jesus cannot be the Christ, for no one will know where the Christ comes from, and they know where Jesus comes from, but do they really? In this, they're mistaken, for they assume that Jesus' place of geographical origin is to be understood humanly. Jesus immediately questions their claim to know where he comes from in 728. But Jesus even goes further. As they do not know where he comes from, they also don't know who sent him. They not only do not know where he comes from, but they also do not really know God. And this, of course, is a huge irony. The Feast of Tabernacles involved a public profession of faith in God and the rejection of idols. The Jerusalemites then attempt to arrest Jesus, but are unable to do this since his hour had not yet come. We have seen that Jesus' hour is the God-appointed time of his crucifixion. In 731, another group appears, which is identified as the people. These people believe in Jesus, or so they say they do. Note that we have now seen four distinct responses to Jesus, the crowd, the Jews, the Jerusalemites, and now the people. The response to Jesus is certainly not uniform, and it creates controversy. In 732 to 36, the Pharisees overhear these opinions about Jesus and are apparently alarmed because some people believe in Jesus. Together with the chief priests, they send officers from the temple to arrest Jesus. He emphasizes that he will be with them a little while and then he will return to the Father. This makes it clear that their plot to kill him will not ultimately succeed. The Jews respond to this with incomprehension. They interpret Jesus' departure in geographical terms, having interpreted his origins in the same way. Once again, the chasm that exists between Jesus and official Judaism is emphasized. In John's portrait, the Jews are unable to understand Jesus because their presuppositions blind them from seeing the truth. In 737 to 52, we arrive at the culmination of the Feast of Booths, or the eighth day. The Feast of Booths also involved the pouring out of water in the temple as both a reminder of the miraculous water in the wilderness, but also to ask God for adequate rainfall. Jesus identifies himself as the Feast of Booths. He is the source of living water. In Ezekiel 47, 1 through 11, a stream of water begins to flow out of the temple that imparts life to everything in its path. And Jesus may well have that image in mind. Note that Jesus takes the place of the temple as the source of living water. The meaning of this water is specified in 739 as the Spirit. As we made clear later, the gift of the Spirit is expected in the last days, Joel 2, 26 to 3, 1. And this will be the full fruit of Jesus' glorification. In 740 to 44, Jesus also provokes a variety of responses. For some, he's the prophet of Deuteronomy 34, while others think that he is the Christ. And still others judge that this is impossible since the Messiah is to be a descendant of David and so must come from Bethlehem. As we've seen, this fails to grasp the fact that Jesus is from God. And once again, there is division. 
Since Jesus does not fit into any neat messianic category, efforts to understand him within them will always be doomed to fail. In 745 to 53, the officers sent to arrest Jesus in 732 now return to the chief priests and Pharisees in 745 without a prisoner. When asked why they've made no arrest, they reply, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees then accuse them of having been led astray by Jesus. And they note that the crowd cannot be trusted to make proper judgments because it doesn't know the law. For the Pharisees, those who do not oppose Jesus have been, in their ignorance, simply deceived by him. Nicodemus now reappears. Remember him from 3, 1 through 15? And he actually challenges the Pharisees. Nicodemus says that Jesus may only be judged if one listens to his words and sees his actions. The Pharisees are unwilling to hear this and accuse Nicodemus of being a Galilean. They claim that no prophet has ever come from Galilee, although Hosea and Nahum were from there, and although Jesus was not from Galilee himself. 